You know what's the same thing about 62% of all Americans? I mean, you might be in another part of the world right now, but I mean, I think the statistic translate. 62% of people after COVID say they don't have anything to look forward to. How do you not have anything to look forward to? But I mean, you can sit anywhere. You can be miserable anywhere, no matter what. You can have your greatest victory, your greatest success. You can be out on a boat and then you can be like, I'm out on the boat, but I'm all wet and there's sand everywhere, including up in my swimsuit, all the places it's not supposed to be. And then I gotta pay a bill and how am I gonna make the money? We can be happy or mad or sad or depressed in the same pants regardless of our circumstances. So what do we do? I mean, it happened to Elijah. He had his biggest victory ever and yet he got depressed. Depression is real. So it's time to beat that bad dog. If depression has been stalking you today, my pastor, Chris Hodges from Church of the Highlands, he wrote a whole book on coming out of the cave. And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna come out of the cave, out of the darkness, into the marvelous light. We're gonna beat depression. We're gonna smack it on the head, kick it in the butt and send it back where it came from and go ahead and start enjoying our life. So click subscribe on YouTube, hit DVR on your TV. Cause you know what? Let's go. Grandfather, pastor, golfer. <laughs> I'm a Cajun from South Louisiana. And do you know what the loneliest bayou in Louisiana is? By yourself. <laughs> my wife, my pillow, and gumbo. Erasers. I have no dance moves. This is the best I have. Oh my gosh, you guys, we have something really exciting today. And I don't know how do you get excited about depression? <laughs> <laughs> There's an oxymoron. Because um, you're a fun guy. You've always Thank got... you. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean a mushroom. Yeah. <laughs> but I have bad jokes. Um, you love to joke. Yeah, you, you eat. You savor life. You yeah. enjoy yourself. Yeah. Uh, you're super successful. So how does somebody in that kind of lifestyle with that kind of success find themselves in a cave, so a book out of the cave, in a cave of depression in the dark. Oh, wow. And I, first of all, I think everybody does at some point in their life. And mine happened actually for the first time in 1999. And most of it was circumstantial. Mm -hmm. So there were just things that were going on that put me in a very dark place. Mm -hmm. I didn't process it the right way. Now that I have the luxury of hindsight, mm -hmm. I realize now that God was uh, in the middle of it. He didn't create it but he was in the middle of it and used it actually to get me out of where I was into the calling that I'm in right now, which mm. should give a lot of people a lot of hope. Yeah. But in 1999, I was in a very, very, very dark place. So much so that I, I thought I, was, I needed to check myself into some kind of facility. Mm -hmm. And so our church always started every year with 21 days of prayer. And so in the 21 days of prayer of the year 2000 on day 17, I had an open vision of what I'm doing today and literally in a moment and I write about it in the book it's not it's not the solution for everyone but for a lot of people having clear purpose or a new assignment is a real way out of the cave can, can you just dive into that a little bit more well and then so nothing happened for 18 years as far as my own personal journey with depression and then in 2018 uh, several pastors in America whom I did not know personally several committed suicide and I'll never forget um, I was reading the story of this one young pastor who took his life and it impacted me as if I knew them personally. And I feel like the Lord spoke to me that day and said, you know, you need to address this. There's probably people in the church who are going through this. I was so honestly naive, did not know that it was something that everyone was going through. So I did a week's worth of study, which is not nearly enough, uh, brought a message and it became the most rewatched message times a hundred. Times a hundred. Oh, it was. It was so overwhelming, the response. So then I kind of felt a little guilty for not bringing it sooner. And so I decided actually that day that I was gonna do years of study, write a book, bring a series of messages and try to help people out of the cave of depression. Who knew that it would be released in the middle of a pandemic and, and, and in a season where most people 
uh, the mental health hotline number went up 900% in 2020. So, so God, God saw this all along, and I really believe it's something that'll help a lot of people. You know, we were designed actually to process with someone else. And so it always feels vulnerable to share that and, and to tell. But I am incredibly honest in this book. I always say confession is good for the soul, but bad for the reputation. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. Well, I've heard a guy say once upon a time, you're only as sick as your secrets. That's exactly right. It was him. <laughs> um, so getting those secrets out, find, finding that non-judgmental person can be really tough. Uh, I think C.S. Lewis is the one who said, Friendship is born at the moment when, when the person says, what, you too? I thought I was the only one. Yeah. And that's what people are actually going to discover. They're, they're not going to be shocked and go, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to go, wow, I thought I was the only one. And of course, James 5, 16 is the verse that you were referring to where it says, confess your faults not to God. Mm -hmm. Confess your faults one to another and pray for each other. And that's where you'll find healing. So we confess to God to get forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I mean, people can't forgive you. Uh, but so we go to God for forgiveness, but we got to go to God's people for healing. But I know you did a lot of research. One of the things that I just one of the reasons you're my pastor is because you were like you love research, right. and so you you dove into some stuff, and I think you found some things that really surprised me when you talked about it. What is some of the stuff you found in your research? Well, first of all, that there is a stigma around this topic. So um, if I get I get the flu or if I break my arm, nobody thinks less of me. Mm -hmm. And, but these are just parts of my body. But when my brain gets sick mm. and we have mental illness, people kind of back up. And so there is a stigma that needs to be removed because the brain can be sick just like my eyes need glasses. Because it's just a body part. So this is a part of my body that's not functioning well and no one's thinking any differently of me. Right. But when that part is not functioning well, so I, I write an entire chapter about removing the stigma of depression that is so and I think honestly and I think the church needs to lead the way yeah. in and being the ones to say hey we're willing to talk about this and let's mm -hmm. let's be, befriend uh, one another um, another one of the surprising discoveries is that most doctors and, and psychiatrists and psychologists think there are about nine different causes generally speaking mm -hmm. uh, m nine major causes of depression mm -hmm. Uh, two of them are genetic or biological, so you have nothing to do with it. You'll, you may need some medication or some kind of therapy, but most of them, seven, seven out of the nine, are things that, that have either happened to us or we're doing to ourselves, and they can be fixed, which should give people a lot of hope. And that's what we want to give you today. We want to give you hope. And I'm going to ask Pastor Chris in just a minute to share some of the ways out because I know you talked about Elijah and he like guided us out of depression, but I did, I've read the passage and I never saw it myself. And so as I was sitting there, uh, we were in this conference in Florida and he was talking about how to get out of depression. I thought this is what people need to hear. I want to let you know just about everybody I've ever met, once we get honest with each other, we find out. I've gone through a period of depression. He's gone through a period of depression. You've gone through a period of depression. And here's the crazy thing about the enemy. He's going to tell you that you're the only one. When a lion hunts, he doesn't go after the herd. He goes after the one who's lagging back, staying in bed, separating themselves, stop going to church, start being alone. What you do is you become prey. What we're going to do today is give you courage to get back in the herd. The enemy is not going to pick you off. We are going to pray with you, and you are coming out of the cave. I know when you feel alone, you just feel lost, right? You feel like you're the only one fighting the battle. You're the only one who gets it. I mean, you might not even be alone alone. You might live in a house full of a whole bunch of people, and yet nobody's paying attention. You're not being hard. You're not getting through, and you just feel like you're in the middle of the ocean, maybe by yourself. But here's the thing, God says, I'm never gonna leave you and I'm never gonna forsake you. You aren't alone. You can't outrun him, you can't outlast him, you can't hide from him. That's one thing about God, man, he's just, he's just everywhere. He's just everywhere and he's just always with you. Even when you do the stuff you shouldn't be doing, he goes with you. The Bible says, even in the pit of hell, I'm with you. He's gonna be with you. He's with you right now. The invisible hand of God sees you. Elijah felt alone, and yet God put him under a juniper tree. Now let's talk about the tree for a second. This is the kind of tree that you can take the roots, you can make a fire and bury it, and they're like coals, they're like charcoal, they stay hot. He had a food source, he had a heat source, he had a shade source, he had all these sources. He wasn't alone, God was providing for him. God's gonna provide for you too. I know it feels dark right now, 
God sent me to be a little messenger of light like the sun and say, you're not going to be alone. You're not going to be depressed. He's with you. He hears you. He's hearing your prayers. And he's here to say, I'm your source of light. And I'm coming after you. So did you survive COVID? Survive the last year? Survive your marriage? Survive not being able to find someone to marry? I know a lot of us are trying to just survive in life. And that's not what God called you to at all. No, God called you to thrive. I know what it means to thrive through adversity. I was molested in fourth grade, raped when I was 13 years old. Life had failed me, but I failed myself when I was in high school and became a pregnant, unwed mother. Doesn't sound like the person who's supposed to have this TV show, but you know what? God doesn't call the worthy, he calls the willing. And he's called you not to survive, to thrive. It's why I wrote a real and organic book that is gonna blow your mind that I am so honest with you, but I did it intentionally to meet you in your pain and take you to the promise that God has for you that has never changed. I can't really put this down. Pastor Nicole, God is using it to um, dig out some areas of healing and faith that I did not know were there. Several chapters got to me, tug of war, glory days, bully bus for sure. Then I got to the wall chapter, and that one really stuck with me because I, I have some work to do. I ordered one book uh, to, to read, and I knew probably halfway into chapter one that I needed to order more. I needed this book to share. I want you to get it for free today at freethrivebook.com. Pastor Chris, how do people get out of this mess? You know what I love about the Bible? It doesn't just tell stories. I think it actually gives us patterns that work thousands of years later. Mm -hmm. Only God could, could tell a story, have it in his holy word, and then it'd still be this playbook. And I think that's what happened with the life of Elijah. So he actually did six of the nine things mm -hmm. that today's psychologists and psychiatrists mm -hmm. say will get you in the cave of depression. Mm -hmm. And then he, he did five things to get out. So when I wrote the book, I actually outlined 1 Kings chapter 19 and just went through step by step of how do you get out of the cave. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab a pencil real quick. Like if you're watching this on YouTube, pause it. If it's on your TV, everybody's got pause on TV nowadays. So like a pause your TV, grab a pen, write some things down. If you are struggling with depression, you need out. And this is a way out. So go grab a, hit pause, grab a pen. And then how do, how do we get out? Well, I love the fact that it's in a cave because in my own personal experience, I think that that is the metaphor that totally describes what it feels like. So it's dark, it's disorienting. Mm -hmm. You know there's a way out, you don't know where it is. And that's exactly how I felt. Mm -hmm. What's so interesting to me, Nicole, is that whenever the angel of the Lord now visits him, it's gonna take him on this five-step journey to get him out of the cave. The angel said, okay, I need you to sleep, then get something to eat, then go back to sleep and get something more to eat. <laughs> now, as a person from South Louisiana, I really love that prescription, I, honestly. <laughs> this is why the Bible is my favorite book. Exactly. This you know, right I'm here. a foodie and you're a foodie. <laughs> so we, we both love this first step because the next line in scripture says, strengthened by that food, mm -hmm. he took the journey. And I think with COVID, change, life and balance, isn't that one of the catalysts? Oh, absolutely. For depression. Oh, most people are living a, a, a lifestyle that cannot be sustained. So you can do it, but not everything that is doable is sustainable. Mm. So we've created a pace that is actually hurting ourselves and we're wondering what's going on. Why can't I even hear from God? Yeah. Well, perhaps you need to be still and know that he is God. Maybe he is talking and there's too many other voices that are competing with his voice. Yeah, and so Elijah was out of control of the things that were happening to him. Oh, he was completely burnt out. So once he actually, <laughs> again, once he slept, ate, slept, ate, the next thing that happened to him is he stepped into this moment where God revealed himself to him. And he came in a, in a, in a, in a gentle whisper, a still small voice, and he was trying to teach Elijah, the art of intimacy, mm -hmm. which I believe is the second step in the journey, that we have to cultivate the presence of God in our lives. Mm -hmm. And you know this, because I know you. You're one, of, you're one of the most incredible worshipers that I know. I know what your morning routine is, which by the way is why you're as healthy as you are, mm -hmm. because it's something that we all need to learn, not just to worship in church services when we have bands and great pastors leading us, but we need to have worship moments in our homes in intimate ways.
can you play something that if you are gonna sit down at your piano at home, just, you know, two, three lines, and you need something to just minister to your soul. Tis so sweet, this is my favorite hymn, to trust in Jesus. This has been my favorite part of the show so far. So when you were in this cave um, and you found yourself there, how did you rest your soul? And how did God get to you? Because that might be what people are thinking. It's like, well, I'm trying to rest my soul, but I can't find time. And I'm trying to hear God, but mm -hmm. Well, notice all of these are called steps, which means I have a role too. So it's a lot of people are just sitting around waiting for God to do something to them. And I'm inviting every person that's listening to your show today to take some steps. You got to step into a need of recovery, step into a God encounter and cultivate the presence of God mm -hmm. and feel this restoration that comes from the presence of God. After they're taking care of their soul and once they're finding God, because I believe you're finding your place where you meet with God. Once they hear from God, what was next for Elijah? So the next verse says he pulled his cloak over his face. So once he was meeting with God, he basically had an identity crisis. Mm -hmm. He was, God was trying to reveal himself, uh, who he is and trying to show Elijah who he was. But Elijah was ashamed and, and covered his face. And then God revealed, in fact, Elijah goes on and says some things that just simply weren't true. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have an identity or a narrative mm -hmm. that's just not even true. And that's feeding the depression. So God did the third thing in this step, and that is he gave him a clear identity. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you who you really are. Let me make sure you know that I know you feel this way, but let me tell you what the word of God says really about you. Mm -hmm. And once we have this rested body, this soul that is feeding on the worship of God, mm -hmm. man, you, you will receive this clear identity and it mm -hmm. sets you up for the next two steps. In, in my head, that's where I've gotten stuck sometimes because my identity has got wrapped up in my who, my doing, not my who. Right. Like what I'm doing, who I'm doing it for, how well I'm doing it, versus just strip all that away. And who who am I? Am I mom? Am I wife? Or am I just God's child? So how do people strip away to get to the place where, hey, I lost my job, things changed, I'm in a different house, you know, I can't buy a house <laughs> because of the right. market's so great, or whatever happens to where it's just, we can get our identity. From well, not only that, but there's a lot of things that are feeding to a poor identity. Mm. I write an entire chapter on the culture of comparison. I call yes. it scrolling away your peace. And, and, and I think it was um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt that said, Com comparison is the thief of joy. So mm -hmm. we're on social media, we're seeing everybody's highlight reel, mm -hmm. comparing it to our miserable lives, mm -hmm. which by the way, that is not their real life. <laughs> <laughs> My stuff's all filtered. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, no one's putting their bad part of their day, they're putting the best part of their day, you know? Yeah. And the best way to get a right identity mm -hmm. is to just to know what God says about you. Mm -hmm. And it comes, honestly, I think in two steps, shutting out what the world says, Mm -hmm. listening to what God says. And of course, you and I both know that comes from his word. Mm -hmm. I really hope this is helping you today because like it is, it is speaking to me and I don't consider myself in a period of depression. I consider myself actually kind of, kind of emotionally healthy right now, which is really great, but I can still identify notes of course. that you're telling me. And I'm like, okay, I need to feed that more. I need, we're getting ready to do some rest. I need to rest more. I do need to just tell myself who God is. And, you know, I think I'm going to take some homework. And if I'm going to do some homework, why don't we do it together? Why don't we Google who does God say I am and write it down? And if you're fighting for your identity right now, as Pastor Chris is getting ready to pray with us in just a minute, if you're fighting for who am I outside of 
what your spouse might have said when they were mad or your boss said because they were aggravated or your kids said because they're teenagers or, or whatever. Not what other people say you are. The enemy tries to remind you of your past, of what was done to you or what was done because of you. Let's really drill it down and let's put in us intentionally who does God say I am? So let's do the homework. Let's go ahead and Google it. Let's write it down. Let's seek out the scriptures. What do I study about in the morning? I want to read the Bible. This is what you read. Find those scriptures. And then if you're feeling like you might be depressed, let's just take five minutes, put them all in one document and read them out loud as you're getting ready in the morning. I am who God says I am. I am a child of the most high king. I am a royal priesthood, a, peop a people that's set apart. I am unique and different. I am purposed for such a time as this. You know, when Esther said that, she looked out thinking she was gonna die, but she was for such a time as this, and so are you. I believe God connected you and Pastor Chris today because God was tired of you living in the dark. And it says in 1 Peter, he calls you out of the dark and into his marvelous light. And I think this is one of those moments where the door of opportunity is being swung on the hinge of obedience and the light of God is coming in to flood your soul. on, don't lose hope. How you start does not determine how you finish. Every book has different chapters. And so you may be experiencing a chapter in the book, but it's not the end of the story. Hold on and have hope. God is not finished yet. I keep my eyes on him. I keep filling my heart with praise and worship. That really helps my spirit stay positive. It keeps me focused on the right things. I stay in the Word of God. I get tools and, and books that help me stay focused and stay positive so that I know that I'm gonna make it to the other side. I have everything that I need that's inside of me. He's given me the strength that I need to make it through any situation. I love the scripture in Isaiah that says, though you walk through the waters, they will not overtake you. Though you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. You know, we're gonna go through fires in life. We're gonna go through water that's gonna almost feel like we're drowning. Water's gonna take us out. Like, I don't know if I can swim one more minute. I'm in too deep, I'm in over my head. You can feel the flames, the, just the um, everything coming in around you. And God says, you're gonna walk through those in the season, but you know what? You're gonna come out the other side. Listen, I know where you are right now. I know that feeling of being down, that feeling of being downtrodden, that feeling where you just don't see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. And what I want to remind you of is that even when you're in that place, God is still good. Pastor Chris, is there any way you would pray for the people? Yeah, first of all, I'd want you to know that there's hope. So the, one of the best gifts you can have is just this hope that you know, God has ordained even this show and this moment to let you know that it, you're not at the end. And so let me just let you know there is a light, there is a way out of the cave, and we encourage you today and let you know that God not only has these incredible steps, but the fourth one that we didn't have, even have time to talk about was the step of that He has a calling on your life, an assignment, which I think is probably the most powerful way to get out of the cave is to know that your life is not here just to survive it. You're here for significance. You're here for calling. You're here to make a difference. And, and you're, you're a part of God's grand design. Um, and, and He has a special place just for you. You're one heartfelt prayer away from your sins being forgiven and guilt and shame leaving your life. <laughs> what an incredible thing, right? And so let me lead you into that prayer. And then I'll pray for all of you who already know the Lord. If you're far from God, Maybe just whisper these words right after me and say, Jesus, forgive me for living my life my way and without you. And today I invite you into my life and receive what you paid for when you died on the cross. Now say this, make this as a confession. Say, I believe you are the son of God and that you died and you rose again. And today I put my faith in you. And Father, I pray for every person who just pray that for that prayer and I, I celebrate with them that their sins are forgiven, they have a home in heaven, and that your spirit has come alive on the inside of them to live a brand new life. Lord, I pray for every person who's listening today. God, let them know who they are, 
God, let them have this assurance. They for, they're forgiven, they're healed, they're called, and they're blessed. And I speak life into every dark place and light into the places where they haven't seen light in a long time. And thank you, God, from this day forward, we'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, this one time there was this guy and he had these two pots. One of them carried water, it was full and it was beautiful. The one on the other side was cracked and it just leaked the whole time. And the pot was so worried, I'm not doing a good job. I'm cracked, I'm broken, I leak, I have problems. And one day it just couldn't take it anymore and it just screamed and he's like, I can't do this anymore. And the guy who was carrying him said, what do you mean? Look at the side of the path that you're on. The side with the pot that looks great and is beautiful, that side of the path doesn't look good. But your side, your brokenness where you were cracked, you leaked all of these amazing things out and you put water and flowers grew. You know, God didn't cause the reason that you're fighting with all these things right now, but God will use it. Here's the amazing thing. If you hurt, if you have pain, if the devil's picked on you, God says the devil has to pay seven times. So today we're gonna take it back. You didn't feel this or go through this for nothing. God's gonna use it for your good and the good of a lot of other people, just like he did Joseph in Genesis 50, 20, just like he did Elijah and just like he's gonna do you. You know what, you help bring just such amazing help, hope and healing to people around the world in Philippines, in Australia, in South Africa, in Africa, in UK, in the US, you do that by helping us. So if you wanna text 77977, you can reach somebody just like we're reaching you right now. I remember the story that I got on DM about a woman who was getting ready to commit suicide and her TV turned itself on. Now, I don't even know how that happens, but God can do anything. And I was saying on the TV as she was making nacho chips and salsa, because it's all the food she had in the house for dinner, I said, you could even be eating nachos for dinner right now. And she's like, oh my gosh, that's me. And she knew we were talking to her. God's making words of life and hope come through. She said she didn't commit suicide, she's turned her life around, and she's living for Jesus. And I believe God wants to do the same thing with you. I wanna pray with you right now. God, while we're out here in your amazing creation, we're not just gonna disdain everything you've done, we're gonna open our eyes new and we're gonna look around and say, wow, this world is pretty wondrous. And you obviously created me on purpose and for a reason to be here. And I don't know what it is right now, but you do. So all I have to do is trust you. And when I trust you, you're going to show me what to do. God, touch them. Reveal things to them. Give them hope. And help them to live the life that you've called them to live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Take one. Action. I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> Share it with you. Isn't it beautiful?